Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance And in your deen allow me to advance Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا فرز بيت الله ألون ويبهازم أن ويسيك الزهلب هم سأفر الله قايز إذا تشولي قايدد وان أن هم سأفر الله ليفز السري نوان كان شهم قايدنس May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad Peace be upon him Dear viewers everywhere, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to a new special episode of Ask Huda. This is the second episode whereupon we share with you our memories of the blessed journey of Hajj. In the previous episode, we spoke about some positives, some great feelings that we experienced, some good memories such as seeing the brothers and sisters who are constantly making dua, supplications, while shedding tears and making sincere tawbah, the unity, the rainbow color that we see everywhere, beautiful blend, people from every background, every mother tongue, from every corner on earth. These are beautiful things. But unfortunately, there were a few things that distracted the attention of the worshippers. And it is very easy to avoid. For instance, by the end of the last episode, uh, we hinted to using the cameras and taking shots and converting the holy sacred mosque into a big studio. Many, many people were diverted from the purpose of the journey, which is the ibadah, the worship, and the manasik, the rites of hajj and umrah. They wasted plenty of time taking pictures. And I know that I uh, may have heard the feeling of some of the brothers and sisters who met with me, whether in Medina or Mecca, and they wanted to take pictures with me where I apologized. Because really, that is not the, the, the place to do things like that, especially in, uh, in the haram. Every uh, time somebody is taking a shot, especially at night time, and the flash of his or her camera goes on, it definitely distracts the attention of somebody, of many, many people. So I hope that we don't have to have a low to ban doing such things. In the past, it was restricted and prohibited. But now with an easy access to um, cell phone cameras and digital cameras that you can hide everywhere, people just smuggle their cameras and they shoot right and left in the studio. It is really sad to see people uh, travel thousands of miles and spend thousands of dollars in order to perform this lifetime journey and they waste a lot of time taking pictures. And guess what? When I came back, I checked my email and there are hundreds of beautiful pictures, professionally taken pictures. So you can download them, you can maintain them, you can keep them. Uh, you don't really have to have uh, to take your own pictures uh, in, uh, in the haram. You have beautiful, professionally taken photos that you can keep. Uh, the second thing is an awful thing that I wish the Ummah can realize that this is one of the worst diseases that is destroying the body of our Ummah, the body and the soul, which is smoking. We always thought that people go to perform Hajj in order to repent from minor and major sins. But it was sad to see people in the Ihram close and they step outside the Haram once they finish the Sa'i and they start smoking. They light cigarettes. Of course, alhamdulillah, some of them, uh, once we advise them, we remind them with the blessing that Allah bestowed upon them to invite them to his house to perform hajj and umrah, uh, they responded to us. And they threw the cigarette and they apologized. But some showed resistance and they were stubborn. They said, I don't care. I don't understand if somebody is going to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness from all his sins, and he's challenging Allah right in Arafah, right in the greatest day 
in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardons all sins. How does it work? There is a conflict of interest. That you just finished the Umrah or the Tawaf and the Sa'a and you step out to smoke. Even if smoking was permissible or the least makruh as some people like to say. I definitely believe that smoking is absolutely prohibited. It hurts others. Smoking everywhere in five-star hotels is prohibited. But people in the rooms are smoking and hurting others. Uh, maybe the room next to them have somebody with asthma. Or in the street, especially it is very, very crowded. You have seen how it is crowded uh, on the screens. So I hope things like that would not be stopped by just giving advices and recommending to people what to do and what not to do. I really appeal to the Saudi authorities and the Prince of Mecca to absolutely put a stop to this disaster. Mecca is the holiest place on earth. The Haram is the holiest spot on earth. It has the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a few yards from the house of Allah, people are smoking. We need to put a stop to that. Smoking should be banned completely. And that will give a chance to the pilgrims who are used to heavily smoke to practice stopping smoking. For 20 days or 30 days, depending on how long is your journey, that can definitely help you out to stop smoking and repent unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, before I go on, let me remind you, this is a live broadcast, another episode of Ask Huda, and you're most welcome to call in. Our phone number is area code 002 02 248 or 249, and we'll be more than happy to take your questions via mail if you send it at ask at huda.tv. Another negative thing that we would like to see disappearing in the upcoming journeys, whether in Umrah or Hajj, so that people can follow up when they return home as well, which is the sisters who are wearing a cultural hijab, or they were not used to wear hijab back home, and when they came to perform Hajj and Umrah, they thought hijab is just mere wearing a scarf, that it keeps sliding back and forth, what I like to call it convertible hijab. That doesn't work. If a woman is not wearing a proper hijab and showing a part of her aura, whether the sleeves roll down because she's wearing open sleeves, or a v-neck, or the, the scarf rolls down, that invalidates the prayer. Because one of the prerequisites of a salah is satru al aura covering and concealing the aura and the aura for a woman in the salah is the entire body from head to toe except for the face and the hands. So, once again, that can be considered a turning point. You practice wearing hijab, you get used to it, you know what you're missing, and you make a new covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, it is sad also to see people trying to practice a sunnah and violate or skip a fard or a pillar. Kissing or touching the black stone is such a great blessing. It is one of the prophetic traditions. He placed his lips on the black stone, he kissed it without making noise. And when he was not able to kiss it, he touched it by his skin. So that is possible. But what if those who are performing tawaf at a time is hundreds of thousands? And people are fighting over reaching the black stone, crying out loud and screaming. And sadly, you see women losing their clothes and their hijab is taken off, fighting in order to touch or kiss the black stone. That is not befitting. And that totally destroys the objective of performing hajj or umrah. We've got the very first call. Uh, of today's program. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Ibrahim from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum. Go ahead, brother. Uh, I have a question back. Uh, if money matters. Yeah, please proceed on. Yes. Uh, my first question is that if money matters. And then, secondly, that uh, uh, if other than in the case of a bad dream, if uh, 
Ibrahim, your voice is breaking off. I cannot hear you clearly. If you can slow down, raise your voice, I may get your question. Uh, okay. So my first question is that uh, that this money considered uh, not just. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot get your question. You're breaking off. Okay, if you can call from a better line, I will appreciate that. Jazakumullah khairan. I may have heard that you're talking about bad dream or so, but I have to get the question right in order to give you the right answer, inshallah. Thank you so much. Sister Najat from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi How are Welcome you, sister? Welcome back, Sheikh. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, I have a question. I'm working as a doctor in Nigeria. Great. And um, I just finished house job. Um, where I'm working, I have my areas that they're supposed to pay me two months, but um, I have I have to sign off house job before that. The problem is that when I sign off, I won't get my areas. So what I'm asking is that is it uh, is it allowed for me not to sign off until I collect my areas, which will be in December, while I actually finish in October. That means my salary in November and December will also be available. Okay. Is it allowed to do what? So, yes. Um, can I collect the salaries in November and uh, December just so as I get my arrears? Because when I sign out, I can't get my arrears. Okay. Okay. Okay, Sister okay. Najat. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling in. Brother Ahmed from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you. Go ahead, Brother Ahmed. Peace be upon you, Sheikh. How are you? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa barakatuh. Peace be upon Dr. Muhammad Salah. Thank you. I've been upon I'm you too. Do you listen to me? Uh, I hear you. Go ahead. Yes, Dr. I live you on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you. Jazakallah khairan. Ahabaka alladhi ahbabtani fi. I want to ask about uh, the best ways uh, to call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am a teacher of English, but I want to know the best ways to call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Inshallah, I will answer you. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you for calling in. Okay, let me resume what I was talking about, which is pushing and shoving each other in order to reach the black stone. While we believe that it is just a stone, and we kiss it because the Prophet ﷺ happened to kiss it, it is a stone that came from heaven. And uh, it is a blessed stone, but it does not benefit nor does it protect from or against any harm. And this is what Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, uh, said. So fighting in order to reach the black stone is not prescribed, nor is it permissible. Rather, keeping peace and tranquility at the haram is what is required. So I hope that we can educate the entire Muslim community from different backgrounds before coming to perform Hajj. As we instruct them and say, kissing the black stone is a sunnah. Meanwhile, we say, but it is not permissible to fight you Muslim brothers or sisters in order to reach to the black stone and kiss it. Um, so, I hope, inshallah, Azza Jal, these negatives will disappear and that can only happen by education, when we educate people, when we spread the word, when we make sure that before going for Hajj, such a sacred journey, the lifetime journey, that everybody knows what they need to do exactly. Many people have taken uh, easy the manasik. While a manasik, we go to perform Hajj in order to fulfill the manasik. Ibrahim and Ismail, peace be upon him, upon completing the building of the Kaaba, they said, وَأَرِنَا مَنَاسِكَنَا وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ They invoked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept the humble effort from them, to make them both Muslims, and to show them the rights of Hajj and Umrah. Some people, they skip many manasik. They just go to Arafah on the ninth day, and uh, without going to Mina. And once they reach Muzdalifah, they do not even wait until it is midnight, they beat the traffic, they go through the stones, they go to do the tawaf. And the least mandatory part is to spend most of the night or until past midnight. If you're one of those who are entitled 
not to stay till the morning, such as elders, women, and weak, and uh, youngsters. But if you're physically fit, you must stay until the morning, and you make dua, then you start moving. We have another phone call. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Um Huraira, all the way from France. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, sister? I'm, I'm fine, thank you. I am calling actually about the Hijra and not the Hajj. Is that okay? Sure, absolutely. Okay, um, I will, I will uh, try to explain the situation. I was uh, born in, uh, and living in Paris since this summer. Mm-hmm. And I am beginning to practice Islam. I was, I was born uh, as a Muslim, alhamdulillah, but I was not um, a good Muslim, as mm. we said. So I met Hizra, alhamdulillah, in, uh, in Morocco. But right now, I feel um, not really comfortable in this, uh, in this country, mm. which I think is not really a good one for me because, um, you know, the, the way... Uh, the people look at uh, the Muslim like us. Um, I don't think they will appreciate the Muslim who want to uh, to follow the Sunnah. Mm. I can say it like this. You're talking about so, living in France, right? Sorry. You're talking about while living in France. No, in Morocco. In France, in Morocco. definitely no. Mm. <laughs> but even in Morocco, it's uh, it's really difficult. I don't know if you know the country. Yeah, kind of. Yes, so right now I am asking if I can make another hijra, but the thing is I have no maharam because mm. uh, I haven't uh, thought about the marriage yet and I don't want to marry with a Moroccan man. Or, so I was, uh, I was thinking if I, if I can make hijra for another country. So do you have a family? Yama, where I can find a do you have a family school? whom you're living with, sister, in, in Morocco currently? Sorry? Do you have a family whom you're living with in Morocco currently? No, I'm still living alone in Morocco. Doing what? Are you studying? Are you seeking knowledge? Learning Quran and Arabic? No, no, because I, uh, I was working in France, so I made a little money uh, in France. And now I am just living with the money that I make in France for a few months. Doing what? Just for, to, learn, um, to learn Quran. And, uh, so you, have you joined a school or do you have a private tutor who is walking you through teaching you the Quran and Arabic? Exactly. I'm, I'm okay. learning in... Uh, I have that Quran and I have a teacher who, uh, who uh, teaches me every morning the Quran. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Okay. Inshallah, I will answer you. Inshallah. <coughs> We have Brother Munir from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, Brother. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? Uh, I have a question for you. Go ahead. Uh, my question is regarding the silk tie. Okay. Uh, is it permissible for men to wear uh, silk tie, which is uh, industrial? You know that there's one is natural silk, another is natural silk. Okay. I have confusion about it. Okay. Um, just to answer you briefly, the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam forbid men from wearing silk and gold. He carried both of them, each one in one hand, and he said these two objects are prohibited for the men of my ummah, but they are permissible for women: gold and silk, al zahab wal harir. Uh, some of the scholars said, unless if it is very insignificant amount equal to the uh, size or uh, the size or the measure of four fingers. Obviously, we're talking about natural silk, not the artificial silk and the acrylic. If it is artificial and uh, uh, acrylic, then prohibition does not apply to that. But the natural silk, if it is uh, natural silk, whether it's a tie or a shirt, it is prohibited for men towards such thing. Wallahu a'lam. The sister who is, uh, Sister Umm Huraira, who migrated from France to Morocco in order to seek knowledge. Uh, I would like to give a general advice to every brother and sister who is living in a non-Muslim country and they decided to seek knowledge or to improve their Iman by migrating to a Muslim country. Uh, you, really ha- you really need to make your homework before making that move. Because it's not just about traveling. You need to have some sort of accommodation. You have to have a plan. And you have to have goals 
and objectives. You achieve one uh, at a time. And according to your achievement, you decide whether you've made the right move uh, or not. Some people uh, call and said, Sheikh, I'm at Cairo Airport. Okay, what for? I'm a muhajir or I'm a muhajira. What am I supposed to do with a woman who came alone by herself uh, to Morocco or to Saudi Arabia or to Egypt and showed up all of a sudden? I don't know them. And they just said, can you help me? How? This is not the right thing to do. Nowadays, if any person, alhamdulillah, Allah put in their heart the love of the deen and they want to increase their iman, even if they're living in any non-Muslim country, there are Islamic centers where you can build up some nucleus of iman, some friendship, brotherhood and sisterhood, in order to know exactly where to go. And you have the fund, you go, you have an address that you're going to, you have a plan that you're going to spend a year or two, you're going to study this and this and that, and you should not uh, have high expectations that you're going to the city of the Prophet ﷺ 1400 years ago, where Al-Ansar are going to open their arms wide for you and say, brother and sister, take my house and I would like to give you my daughter in marriage or sister, you can live with us in the family and we'll take care of you. Uh, it may happen, but this is not the picture currently. So that's why we got to know that we're living in a time that the Prophet ﷺ called it Zaman al ghurbah the time of strangeness. The, the believers, the sister just said that the people in uh, wherever she's living in a Muslim country right now, the people of Sunnah, appear strange to the common folk if they practice the sunnah. This is uh, literally almost everywhere in, in the world. But if you need to be religiously committed and practice your deen, absolutely you'll find a company who can assist you and help you out uh, to do that. I would not advise you to make another move to any other country before make your, you make your homework and know exactly where you want to go. And traveling alone without uh, a male mahram is very, very problematic, and it creates a lot of uh, problems. So what I can do for you right now is I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send you a good life mate who can take care of you, who can help you out in order to achieve your good goals. It doesn't matter whether he's Moroccan, whether he's born Muslim or a revert. What really matters is that he's a man of the deen. Wallahu a'lam. We have another phone call. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, young sister Sumaya from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. How are you and how old are you? I'm eight years old. MashaAllah, la quwata illa billah. Okay, what you got today, Sumaya? Many, many congratulations, Sheikh. Hajj Mabru, Sheikh. Thank you so much. May Allah bless you and your family. Have you performed Hajj Sumaya? Yes, I performed. I bet you did. Great, MashaAllah. How was it? Did you like it? Yes. Was it crowded? Yes. Very. Right? MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Sumaya, do you have a question today for us? Yes. Go ahead. I have two questions. But first question is, can we touch the Quran without wazoo? Okay. What and about... the second question is, how should we perform the four sunnah of Zohar and Asar prayers, that is two by two, or four rakats, with one salam? Thank you, Shaykh. You're most welcome, Sumaya. I really appreciate your calling in. May Allah bless you and your family. Um, performing Sunnah, the four rakahs, whether before Dhuhr or after Dhuhr. We said that there is a sound hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, Salatul layli masna masna. The night prayer is to be offered two by two. That is the best format. And in another narration, he said, Salatu layli wa nahar, masna masna. Whether you pray at night or during the day, the voluntary prayer, the nafl prayer, uh, is best to be offered two by two. So even the two sunnah before dhuhr or after dhuhr, four, two by two, and after two by two. Because there is one hadith in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever maintains this sunnah of praying four rakahs before dhuhr, and four rakas after dhuhr, Allah will forbid and prohibit his flesh for fire. He would not enter the fire of hell. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all again in the fire of hell. Similarly, in the sunnah, whether the four rakas before, asr, or the dhuhr, 
before or after. As far as touching the Quran without uh, wudu, there is a dispute with, between the scholars whether uh, the verse of Surah Al-Waqi'ah which says لا يمسه إلا المطهرون not to be touched by, but by the purified ones. Whether this verse is pertaining اللوح المحفوظ the preserved tablet beneath the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Quran. Because it says في كتاب مكنون لا يمسه إلا المطهرون تنزيل من رب العالمين so to come out of dispute, it is best to make sure that you have wudu before touching the Quran with bare hands. That is pertaining wudu, which is in order to lift or remove the minor impurities such as passing wind, urination, or defecation. But in case of major impurities such as janaba, it requires ghusl, and no one is allowed to touch the Quran or even read the Quran while in a state of major impurity. Wallahu a'lam. We have another phone call. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Fatima from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Sister Fatima? Welcome back home. Thank you so much. My question is, I performed my Salah before the Fajr. In 1995. 95. And I didn't, I, I didn't proceed to Medina to say, uh, to say the uh, Islam correctly, but we took our uh, Islam at Jeddah and mm. then entered Mecca. Okay. So you made Ihram, we, you made Ihram at Jeddah, you made Ihram at Jeddah, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, I'll answer you, Sister Fatima, inshallah, what to do. Uh, okay, Brother Muhammad from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, how are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Go on. Uh, I just want to know the authenticity of a couple of ahadith regarding Duff. Hmm. Uh, Qadi, it, in the first text, it is reported that. Khadi Shureh heard the sound of the duff being played, whereupon he said, Verily, the angels do not enter the house in which a duff is played. Mm. It was reported by Ibn Abi Shaiba with a good Jayid Sanad. Mm. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, and, hello? I hear you. Uh, and uh, Muhammad Nasiruddin Albani verified it. Uh, in the another text that Ibrahim and Nakai said the disciples of Abdullah bin Masood used to confront young girls who had the foof with them in the narrow alleyways, confiscate their instruments and break them up. Mm. And, and authentically related by Ibn Abi Shaiba. Mm. I just want you to comment upon this. Okay, I got it, Muhammad. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we'll go for a short break, then we'll resume afterward, inshallah. So stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There are 1.5 billion Muslims around the world. 500 million of them live as minorities in 149 countries around the globe. How can the Muslims be involved in society um, and at the same time be committed to their religion? What kind of lives do they live? What are the challenges that face Muslims living in non-Muslim communities? It is a challenge, yes. For Muslims who live in the West, it is a challenge, yes. When you find yourself 
live in some area, you don't hear the azan as you hear it in the Middle East. Mm. You don't uh, you don't find people are able to go for the congregation prayer as as it is very much common in the Muslim countries. Uh, when you go to any any store and you you're gonna make sure that the food that you are taking is halal. This is a challenge. Mm. When you find that there is no Islamic school to find your your kids or to or a sheikh, somebody who can teach your kids Quran. What are the social, political, and economic problems that such Muslims face? How we should be interacting with our non-Muslim neighbors as a Muslim minority. How do they perceive their strengths and weaknesses? And alhamdulillah, wherever we go, every spot in the world I can tell, you can find a Muslim family lives over there. Yeah, when you walk <laughs> and you find suddenly somebody is addressing you. Assalamu alaikum, brother. <laughs> uh, I remember uh, in France, officially, there are now between six and seven million Muslims actually living in France mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also I think in the UK officially between three and four million. Join Abdullah McIntosh who hosts Imam Rifat Muhammad, Imam of the Islamic Center of Barrie, Canada. They are going to discuss the challenges of Muslim minorities around the world in straight path. <laughs>
this people? Are they allowed to enter the masjid or uh, is some I condition? totally agree with you and Islam regulated that. I will share with you inshallah what is the Islamic way concerning non-Muslims entering the masjid. Okay. Um, among the callers that we have some pending questions, Sister Naja, who is a doctor, called from Nigeria and she said that she postpones getting her salary, uh, getting paid in order to get a raise. As far as I understand that she means that when she postpones collecting her payments, she gets an extra uh, money, whether this is an interest or a raise, whatever you call it. But here is the point. This money is attached to postponing the payment. So this is some sort of interest. And interest is prohibited in Islam. Because if you collect it innocently, you get so much. So if you collect it a month from now or two months later, it's supposed to be the same amount. Unless if this money is invested somewhere where you are a partner in the investment, where you share the loss as well as the gain. So if this is the case, you get a percentage of the profit, not a certain raise or a certain interest uh, dealing with the delay of receiving your salary. May Allah guide us to what's best and make sure that we will earn uh, from a lawful earning. Thank you, Sister Najah. Uh, we have another phone call. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Ayan from the USA. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? Wa alaikum How are you? Great. Alhamdulillah. Couldn't be better. Yes. My question was, uh, uh, we have uh, like a lot of Muslims, like you know, a lot of chefs. They don't like train to be a uh, diet uh, to do dawa mm -hmm. in Africa, like the chefs in Africa and Asia. So I was wondering if there is a training for them. Because it's important for us Muslims to do that. That was being done to us, all right? Okay. In okay. Thank you, Sister Anne from the United States of America. Okay. Uh, Muhammad uh, from Egypt, or Ahmed, um, eventually asked about the best way of giving da'wah. Uh, I do have a program on how to give da'wah. Uh, it is like 12 episodes, an hour each. It is with the Sharia Academy. Uh, it, it really requires uh, the methodology, studying the methodology of da'wah according to the practice of the Prophet وسلم, and what was stated in the Quran. So whatever we do, particularly with the da'wah, it has to stem from the Quran and the Sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laid down the foundation of giving da'wah in the Quran. In one verse he said, Ud'u ila sabili rabbik. You must give da'wah and call people unto the path of your Lord. How? Bil hikmah. Wisdom. And the good admonition. And argue with them with one which is best. The scholars say this verse, this particular verse, summoned all the methods of da'wah. Because you're either dealing with fellow Muslims, so you must approach them uh, with uh, a good admonition, reminding them, all of us, our Iman increases and decreases, so we have to help one another. And also Sister Anne from the United States of America said some people do not care about giving da'wah. Uh, is it optional? No, it is not optional. Every person, every Muslim must give da'wah in a way or another. Some people must give da'wah by giving speech in, uh, speeches and delivering khutbah and uh, holding seminars and teaching at schools, synagogues, churches and prison because they're outspoken and they have the knowledge. And others can give da'wah in their fields with their uh, fellow professional colleagues uh, through the way that they deal with others. Merchants can give da'wah and this is how Islam spread in the Indian subcontinent. When uh, the Indian people have seen how Muslims are honest and uh, trustworthy, they're dealing with others. It is not necessarily by giving a speech, by dealing with people as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed us to deal with each other. This is the best way to set an example and be a role model. This is one of the best ways of giving da'wah. Then al-hikmah is required in every stage and with every individual, which is wisdom. Sometimes the hikmah requires that you pause. Do not say a word. Because if the person is extremely angry and you want to deliver the, the advice right now, it might bring the opposite effect. 
Remember when Abu Bakr Siddiq was sitting once and somebody was addressing him with foolishness. And the Nabi Sallallahu was sitting, he was watching, he did not say a word. Then the man kept going on and on and on and Abu Bakr was quiet. Then all of a sudden Abu Bakr decided to reply back. And once he replied, after a long series of uh, foolishness, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got up and he left. So Abu Bakr Siddiq thought that the Prophet was uh, upset from him or with him. So he ran after him and said, Ya Rasulullah, you've seen what he did to me. He said, Ya Abu Bakr, so long as you are quiet, Allah has appointed an angel to reply on your behalf. Once you started replying on behalf of yourself, the angel departed and a shaitan attended. And I do not sit in a place where there is a shaitan in. We realize that the Nabi Wasallam did not object to him in the meeting because Abu Bakr Siddiq have reached the threshold where he was really angry. So you never know what he would say or reply to the Prophet Wasallam at that time. In Hajj, many people got very furious and angry. So... We do not intervene at the time of anger. We do not remind them you are in Hajj, yaw, and be quiet and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let them calm down first because guess what? Some people, whenever they are so infuriated, when you try to calm them down, that increases them nothing but anger and intolerance. So that is the hikmah. Wajadilhum, the argument with those who have the knowledge of their book. And if this argument is going to produce a benefit, then it is recommended, but with one which is best, and the Quran also explained to us. So I may refer you to Sharia Academy in order to download the course of uh, giving da'wah. We have another phone call. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Jamila from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, sister. How are you? I'm okay. I have Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm okay. 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 Uh, I'm I have three questions. I'm presently in Makkah. MashaAllah. <coughs> and uh, I find that uh, the prayers in Makkah, you know, you mix the guys and the ladies together in the south. Sister, can you, is, can you mute your TV set, please? No. Sister Jamila, if you're saying a word, just uh, lower Sorry. the volume or mute your TV set. Thank you. Okay. Now, go on. Now you're currently in Mecca. What about the prayer? What's bothering you there? No, no, no. You have not muted your TV set yet. I can hear myself. Okay, is that better? No, you need to mute it completely. Uh, is it better now? Yeah, much better. Now. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm just asking about the prayers when we are in the south in Mecca. The ladies and the guys are all standing together to pray. Is it okay? Next. Uh, the second question is, can we bring in the slippers? I think, you know, we carry slippers in. When we go to Mecca, we always lose our slippers. So is it okay to bring it into the place where we pray? Okay. Your third question, please. Right. And third question is, if I have some problems like uh, keeping my wudu. Like uh, I have frequent passing of wind, uh, how can I consider it as a disease or, because otherwise it would be very difficult for me to, uh, okay, in the I got it sister Jamila, thank yeah. you so much. And sister Safiya from Nigeria, and I really have to hold on, on your phone calls, because we have many, uh, uh, pending questions. So inshallah, I would like to answer them first. Sister Safiya, go on. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, uh, my first question is about uh, keeping uh, having a concubine. I know slavery was abolished, uh, but some people say that there are some countries that still have slaves. So, is it allowed for a Muslim man to have a concubine or keep a concubine since slavery is still? What, what do you do with a concubine, Sister Sophia? Huh? What do you do with it? Um, <laughs> really, I don't know. Because um, I go to an Islamic school. Yeah. And a lady asked the question. And the uh, sheikh, he said it's allowed to have to keep a concubine. I understand. I'm not asking about the question. My inquiry is about what is yeah. the purpose of keeping a concubine at home? Is it a pet? 
sorry, I didn't get that. Why do you keep the concubine at home? Why? It's for the man. I don't know what his reason is, but it's happening now, so I don't know what his reason is. Okay. Okay, Sister Sophie. Um, Sister Fatima, Fatima from Nigeria, she was asking about that 1995 she performed Hajj. May Allah accept and this is a typical question. She did not perform the ihram from the appointed miqat. Rather, she waited until she arrived to Jeddah airport and there she assumed the intention of haram. I don't know why. Because once again, people do not do their homework. They do not study before going. Sister, you violated a wajib, a mandatory part of hajj, which is making the ihram from the appointed miqat. And you can rectify that even though it's been more than 10 years ago, by offering a fidya, it has to be slaughtered and distributed a sheep to be slaughtered and its meat must be distributed among the poor people of Mecca. Uh, perhaps you can wire the money to a Rajhi bank or any of those um, uh, firms and they would uh, do it on your behalf insha'Allah azajal and that will rectify your hajj. Your hajj, if you've done everything complete and perfect other than that, is conditioned on fulfilling this part. Okay? Uh, we have one sister who called me today and she said that her sister was performing Hajj and she threw the stones every day perfect. But on one day there was a rush and she threw only five stones and she failed to throw the remaining two stones. According to Imam Shafi'i wa Ahmad ibn Hanbal, may Allah have mercy on both of them. As long as it is not three stones and more or up, then it would be sufficient to give uh, a mud. A mud is a handful of food per each stone. So two muds, that is half sa, approximately one and a half kilogram of food, you give it to one poor or two pe poor people in Mecca, and that will rectify it. Um, Imam Malik, of course, requires a fidya, whether it's one stone more or less. Uh, brother uh, Uthman from United Arab Emirates was inquiring about non-Muslims entering the masjid and making this as a fashion. It's really a fashion particularly in North America and some Muslim countries where they have turned the masjid into a tourist places, monuments. So people just enter to wander around, take pictures and so on. If it is for tourism, no, it is not permissible. Because they are not pure, nor clean, nor there is a legitimate reason that justifies their entrance. But if they are entering in order to attend a seminar, or to give them da'wah, or for a dialogue, it is permissible in this condition, as long as they comply with the dress code, particularly women. And guess what? Whenever we have non-Muslim uh, college students, or uh, police officers, or FBI agents who wanted to know about Islam and attend the course in, in the masjid. Obviously, we have a hole for that. But it's still in the masjid. So there is a dress code. And they comply with that better than many Muslim brothers and sisters. Sisters who do not come with a proper hijab to the masjid and insist on sitting with the men and mingling with them. So when we set the rules, and Nabi Wasallam hosted the delegation of Nasara Najran the Christians of Najran for a few days in the masjid in order to inform them about the deen. The deen. Um Muhammad said that her brother, uh, she found out on his website a greeting for non-Muslims saying Merry Christmas. It is not permissible for Muslims to congratulate non-Muslims with their religious holidays, particularly Christmas, because they believe that Jesus was the Son of God and uh, he was the Holy Spirit, or, or, or. So this belief, according to Islamic belief, is a disbelief. So when you congratulate them for this belief, it is a sign of approval. And we're not supposed to do that. Rather, we're supposed to give them da'wah and say, مَا الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمَ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ وَأُمُّهُ صُدِّيقَةٌ كَانَ يَأْكُلَانِ الطَّعَامِ Jesus, son of Mary, was nothing but a prophet, whom before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have appointed many prophets. He was a human being, and his mother was a human being as well, and both of them used to eat. Used to eat, used to drink, used to sleep, used to answer the call of nature. So this is our belief with regards to Jesus, 
and we're not supposed to encourage people to disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, we still have some pending questions. I tried my best. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardon us all and give us help and bless us all. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. Hopefully, inshallah, in the next episode, um, I will cover some of the pending questions in addition to the pending questions from the previous episode. And until then, I leave you in the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Help me in my quest